Good morning and welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. My name is Brittany Board and I'm the children's minister here at Grace. And this is Chrissy. And Chrissy has kind of become our mascot in children's during the whole pandemic. Now it's time to pass the peace. We invite you to pass the peace by letting us know you're worshiping with us this morning and saying hi to someone in the comment section. One, two, three. When night has fallen and fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. Welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. My name is Jessica Aziz and I'm one of the co-pastors here. It is so, so good to worship with you all this morning. If Grace Avenue is your home church, we invite you to register your attendance using the link below. And if you've been watching online for a couple of weeks now, we want to connect with you. So we invite you to email me at jessica at graceavenue.org and I'd love to connect with you through that. 
Well, each year as a church, we do something special called Blessing of the Backpacks. It's a time when we bless all of the backpacks of our students uh, and our teachers, and we offer a time uh, to just pray over all of our students and teachers and staff, anybody involved in the school system. And so we're gonna be having that the weekend of August 9th. So we want you to put that on your calendar um, and more details about that are to come. Well, today is our last Soul Care Sunday, and then on Tuesday, we're gonna have a deep dive. And this week, we are focusing on the practice of meditation. Meditation is something that's probably super, super not what you're used to. And so we invite you to join us right after worship on Zoom for a discussion about meditation. And then on Tuesday night at eight, we'll go into a deep dive about that. Well, that wraps up our announcements. Let's continue in worship. Well, good morning again, everyone, and welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Modern Worship, and I want to invite you to help make your space a sacred space this morning. If you haven't already, go ahead and grab your candle. Um, we light a candle every week um, here in the worship center, but we also, each individual one of us as part of the modern family, light a candle in our homes as a reminder of the Holy Spirit connecting us all together and that Christ is the light of the world. So if you'll light your candle this morning as a reminder of our connection together, and then we'll continue in our worship. Hi, I'm Brian Stitzinger. And I'm Melinda Stitzinger. Here in Modern at Grace Avenue, we gather as a unified community from all walks of life. Without exception, we belong. We affirm and embrace people from every race, ethnicity, age, economic status, marital status, gender or sexual identity, ability or faith background, because all people reflect the face of God. Without exception, we belong. We seek to embody God's grace and justice in our community and in our world. And we recognize that historically the church hasn't always done that. Part of our work together is to help right some of those wrongs. Without exception, we belong. In this space, we bring our full selves. We engage our minds, we struggle with our doubts, we cultivate sustainability, and we carry one another's burdens. Without exception, we belong. Bye. 
Colbert, and I'm going to be reading the scripture this morning. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. Listen and hear the word of God. Ask, and you will receive. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door is opened. Who among you will give your children stone? when they ask for bread, or give them a snake when they ask for fish. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, you should treat people in the same way that you want people to treat you. This is the law and the, pro the prophets, the word of God for the people of God. Well, Modern Family, it is great to be with you today as we uh, find time to worship God together. A big shout out to Jane for reading our scripture today. Um, as we finish our sermon series on the Holy Shift, we find ourselves in Matthew 7 today. And it is um, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. Have you guys heard the story about the two young men who broke into a department store in a big city one night? They were in the store for about an hour or so and they did what they came to do and made their escape unnoticed. But this is really where the story gets intriguing. The young men were not robbers. They didn't steal anything. 
They didn't remove a single item from the store. No, as a joke, these pranksters just changed the price tags on the merchandise. They changed the values. They repriced most everything in the store. They took a $5 price tag off a paperback book and they put it on a television set. They took the $400 price off the TV, they put it on a t-shirt. They took the $350 price tag off of a camera and they put it on some $10 earmuffs and they put the $10 earmuff sticker on a diamond necklace. Now what's really amazing about this story is what happened the next morning. The store opened as usual. The employees came to work as usual. Customers began to shop as usual. The department store functioned as usual all morning before anybody noticed that something was different. Some folks got unbelievable buys. Others got ripped off. This all went on for over four hours before anyone realized that the price tags had been switched. The values had been changed. And this is a great parable for us today because all around us in our modern society, people are trying to do that to us. They are changing the price tags, switching the stickers, confusing and distorting our values. They want to peddle the most valuable things for pennies and sell the cheapest things for millions. Who changed the price tags? Who switched up our values? What happened to respect and courtesy and graciousness and honesty and integrity and goodness and morality? And how do we turn it around? How do we make a difference? How do we remember and give energy to the things in life that really matter? The last few weeks, we've been focusing in on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew. In Jesus' words, we find over and over again that he is changing the price tags. He's taking the things that people value and showing them God's value. And in doing so, he's challenging us, challenging us to shift what we value. He's been calling us for thousands of years to a holy shift. The first week of this series, we studied the Beatitudes and what some scholars call the great reversal. Those who seem to have it all together, who today are on top, will find it in the future dimension of the kingdom that they will be at the bottom. The Beatitudes not only speak words of encouragement to the poor in spirit, but are a moment where Jesus is calling all of us to a holy shift. He's changing the price tags. They are meant to move the arrogant to humility. The Beatitudes encourage and they call. The second week of this series, last week, we studied the Lord's Prayer, but we also looked at the heart and intentionality of how we pray. Jesus noted that the religious leaders of his day practiced their piety in such a way as to be noticed by other people. He said, in essence, they pray and they fast and they help the poor, but they do it so people will notice and praise them. Jesus calls the disciples and us to a holy shift. He once again changes the price tags. He shifts the values. And he challenges his followers to do their personal acts of piety, not so that others can see. And he taught us that our motives are just as important as our actions. The heart by which we do the work that God calls us to do is just as important as the work itself. And now today we arrive in Matthew 7 which Jane so beautifully read for us this morning. And like so much of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, it's calling us to a holy shift. And it's not as simple as it first appears to be. So as we prepare our hearts and minds for a holy shift this morning, let us pray together. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Matthew 7, 7 to 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. These might be some of the most misunderstood verses in scripture. And I know what some of you are thinking this morning, Christopher, you say that about a lot of scripture. And well, that's because a lot of scripture is misunderstood by all of us, me included. Some people have latched on to these words that we read in scripture today as a guarantee that they can have whatever their heart might desire. 
They make it like some sort of cosmic vending machine. Insert the right words and God will deliver the product as promised. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If we take these words out of context, we might think that someone who asks for wealth or possessions will always receive them. Someone who seeks happiness or the love of their lives will find what they seek, and someone who knocks on the door of opportunity for an ideal job and a life of worldly success will find doors opening. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. He's once again shifting the way we think about, talk about, follow, and live our lives for God. So this isn't a formula for getting what we want from God. And if it's not that, then then what are these verses saying? Some scholars call these two verses found in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, beggar's wisdom. They're meant to encourage persistence. If you keep on asking, seeking, and knocking on doors, finally, someone will help. But Jesus shifts the meaning of this text in the next verses when he talks about being a good father. The point is no longer human persistence, but divine goodness. Ask, seek, and knock are not three different actions, but three different expressions of prayer. Ask God for what you desire. Seek God's will. Knock on the doors of mercy. Prayer is not an abstract theological problem. It's a dynamic part of a relationship with God. We should not think of Matthew 7, 7 to 12 as a formula for an effective prayer. If you ask, seek, and knock, God will answer. Instead, we should picture prayer within the context of the love between a parent and a child. In this setting, eager, even urgent and demanding requests are met with gracious and wise gifts. And that then brings us to verse 12 this morning, what we now call the golden rule. The wording that Jesus uses here is very interesting. The verse begins with so, or depending on your translation, therefore, meaning that this verse applies to everything that Jesus has said up to this point and not simply the previous paragraph. When I talk to the students in our youth program, I often say, if you forget everything else that I've said, remember this. And Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's summarizing and saying, essentially, what I'm trying to teach you is about how we treat each other. In everything you do, do so others would have them do to you what you do unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. And this is a vision for God's kingdom. It's a radical call from Jesus to a holy shift in deciding to move away from cultural values to a life of trust and obedience in God. Christ placed a very high value on that, and so should we. But it's so hard to live by this simple and yet powerful statement of Jesus. And if you think it's easy, I don't think you've been on social media lately. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you goes out the door when you find a person who has a belief that is different than yours. Should we go back to school in person or online? Should you wear a mask? Should we reform the police? Do unto others is a whole lot more complicated than most of us imagine. I think a lot of us think it's as simple as kindness, but it's so much more than that. Do you remember the real story of Rapunzel? I'm not talking about the really sweet, cute Disney version. I'm talking about the fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm. The story of a beautiful girl named Rapunzel who lives with a wicked witch in a drab and dingy tower. That old witch is holding Rapunzel captive and to keep her in her place, the wicked witch does two things. First, she removes all of the mirrors in the tower so that Rapunzel cannot see what she looks like. And then the old witch tells Rapunzel repeatedly that she is ugly. In fact, the witch says to her, Rapunzel, you look just like me. Since there are no mirrors in the tower, poor poor Rapunzel believes it. She can't see how beautiful she is. She remains a prisoner in the tower, a prisoner in her own supposed ugliness. The witch believes that if Rapunzel is convinced of her own ugliness, 
she will never try to escape from that tower. The witch has broken into the store. She's changed the price tags. But then one bright day, a prince comes riding by on his white horse just as Rapunzel is leaning out of the tower for a breath of fresh air. Their eyes meet, and it is love at first sight. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair, says the prince. And she does just that. She lets her long flowing hair down from the balcony, and the prince climbs up into the tower. But now look what happens. They gaze lovingly into each other's eyes. And Rapunzel sees for the first time that she is beautiful. And in that moment, she is set free, free from the witch, free from the tower, free from the past, free from the feeling that she is ugly. And then the prince takes Rapunzel into his arms, they parachute onto his horse, and they ride happily off into the sunset. It's a fairy tale, to be sure. But there's a powerful message there for you and for me. All of us are prisoners. All of us are captives. Until Christ comes to set us free and we see in the reflection of his eyes that we are valuable. He comes saying to us, you may be living in a tower of ugliness of your own design, of the world's design, but you are beautiful to me. You are valuable to me. You are special to me. He flips the script. He switches the price tags. He calls us to a holy shift and he challenges us with that golden rule. Treat others the way you want people to treat you. Let me ask you something. Be honest now. When people look into your eyes, what do they see? Do they see acceptance or rejection? Warmth or coldness? Concern or indifference? Love or prejudice? Can people see reflected in your eyes the Spirit of Christ? That is our purpose, to reflect the redemptive Spirit of Jesus Christ, to be God's agents of love and reconciliation. Christ has placed a high value on us, and we are supposed to place an equal value on each other. What is your defining story? What is the narrative that shapes the way you view the world and your place in it? What determines how you understand your life mission and your ultimate destination, how you face adversity, and how you put into context all of the suffering that you see around you? William Sangster was the pastor at the largest Methodist church in England during World War II and for 10 years after that. He had a passion for helping people know Christ and for renewing the Methodist Church, which had been in decline in England for over 50 years. He also wrote numerous books. Sanger's Special Day Sermons was his last. Sanger's Church, uh, Westminster Methodist, sits across from Westminster Abbey. And its Methodist Central Hall seats about 3,000 people. Every Sunday morning and evening, people would pack the place to hear Sanger's preach. He was there at World War II, including one stretch when the Nazis bombed London for 57 straight nights. And during the war, tens of thousands of people sought refuge at some point in the basement of Central Hall. Sangster and his wife would often stay up until midnight helping people get settled into the church. And then they would sleep on the floor of the men's bathroom. Every weekend, the church filled with people looking for a message that spoke to their heads and to their hearts. Something that helped them make sense of all the evil in the world and let them find hope in the midst of it. Week after week, he would remind them of their defining story, of our defining story. That this is not a world without suffering, but a world in which God has come to us to walk with us and promise that evil will never have the final word. After the war, Sangster's church became the first home of the United Nations before it moved to New York City. And then in 1956, at the age of 56, Sangster was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS. And within a year, he couldn't preach anymore and he had to surrender his pulpit. A year later, he was unable to speak at all. 
And before his death in 1960, he decided to put together one last book of sermons. The book is really quite good, but it was the foreword to the book written by his son Paul that is a real testament to his life. It says this, These sermons from the last works of my dad, they were sent to the publisher only a day or two before he died. The last weeks of his life, he was virtually helpless, retaining only a little strength in the two fingers of his right hand with which to hold a pen. And therefore, this book, yet the finest sermon he would ever preach, came not from this book. That distinction belongs to the last years of his life. It was then that my dad preached his best, curiously enough, in silence. Sangster's defining story was the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the midst of his battle with Lou Gehrig's disease, he believed not that God had afflicted him, but that God was with him every single day and that somehow God could even use this for his glory. He believed in the end, life conquers death. And so disease would not have the final word. That is what a life looks like whose defining story is the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sangster's story is a story of victory and hope, a living out of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. This is what we find in the Sermon on the Mount. We find words that help us to have a holy shift in the things we value, a holy shift in the way we pray, and a holy shift in how we treat each other. Jesus changed the price tags. He showed us what to truly value. He showed us the way, and now he challenges us to live it, to have every person we meet see reflected in our eyes, their inherent value. When we walk in the footsteps of the resurrected Christ, we walk with hope. Sangster counted on it. The disciples counted on it. What are you counting on? What is your defining story? Amen. Join me in prayers of the people. I'm going to lift up a category and I invite you to um, name a prayer request or someone um, in the comment section and we will be in prayers over that. Let us pray together. God of justice, truth, and peace, teach us to value what is precious in your sight, to devote our time and energy to what brings you joy. May your Holy Spirit bless us in our daily lives so that even amid, amidst all our worries and responsibilities, we remember your love for us and remain thankful for your gifts. God, this morning we lift up to you our weary hearts. May our souls find peace in your presence. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We lift up the many places in the world and in our country struggling right now with the coronavirus. We pray for healing for all who are sick and comfort for all who mourn loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you our leaders who face challenging decisions about when and how to reopen our schools. We pray for all teachers, staff, and students. God, give them wisdom and discernment to guide our community safely through these hard times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we lift up to you all who continue the ongoing challenging work of dismantling racism and systemic poverty. Help us to see that every single child is created in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift all those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. May they be healed by your power and love. Mm -hmm. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory. Amen. Let's continue worship through our offering. God is calling us to make a difference in our local community. One way we are doing that is by serving lunch and accepting school supplies and gift card donations for students in need in our community. We are able to be the hands and feet of Christ because of your generosity. There are many different ways to give. You can give online through the link that will appear in the comment section. You can set up a recurring gift. You can text in your gift and mail it or bring it by the church. Let's give today with grateful hearts. One, two, three, four.
Well, it has been a pleasure to worship with you today. Uh, one reminder that we do have our final Soul Care Sunday immediately uh, after worship today. You'll see the Zoom link in the comment section. Um, Wendy is going to be leading us in a conversation on meditation. And I know what some of you are thinking, meditation really isn't for me. I'm not a really big fan of sitting still with my eyes closed and breathing. But I promise you, it's so much more than that. And Wendy brings an incredible perspective to it that I cannot wait for you to hear. So I hope you'll join us immediately after the service. As we prepare to depart today, I give you this blessing and benediction. What is your defining story? What is God calling you to do? And when people look into your eyes, do they see reflected in them the value that Christ has put on to all of us? Let us live by the golden rule this week, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. And let us remember that knock, seek, and ask are not actions, but prayers. Let's go forward with this blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever life takes you this week, I hope you find your way back on to Modern at Grace Avenue. Amen.